We are still dealing with the article. This is the article uh, part one, lecture two, and we will later have article part two, which will be just one lecture by itself. As you can tell, because of how extensive the article is used in the New Testament, there's quite a bit of material for us to cover, and we're really doing just a little bit more than scratching the surface. So in our first part, we've been discussing the origin of the article, the function of the article, uh, regular uses, and the absence of the article. In this lecture, we're going to be dealing with the article as a substantiver and as a function marker, and then we'll discuss the absence of the article. Previously, we looked at the article as a pronoun, four different uses, with substantives both as an individualizing and a generic article. So the first thing I want to discuss is the article as a substantiver. This really is part of the genius of the article. It picks up uh, the, the, the usage of turning virtually any part of speech into uh, a substantive or a noun. It can take an adverb, uh, uh, adjectives, prepositional phrases, particles, infinitives, participles, even finite verbs on occasion, and phrases, uh, and turn those into nouns. This is really an amazing feature of the article in Greek because it is so elastic and so different uh, from what we have uh, in English. As a substantiver, it also carries the semantic force that it has with uh, other substantives. So you want to keep that in mind. This is the first step in determining how the article is used, and then you look at it to see if it also has the semantic force. So I offer a few illustrations to begin with. First of all is Philippians 1.21. For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Here you have Todd Zane, to live, and that's going to be the subject of the first clause. You recall that the subject is going to be articular, a pronoun, or a proper name. Here we have Todd Zane, which is going to be articular. It's an articular infinitive, but that counts as an articular noun. And Christos. How do we know which is subject, which is predicate nominative? Usually we would tell by word order between these two, but then when we get to the parallel in the second clause, we can tell because you have ta apothenine, to die, and then kurdos, which is the word gain. It's not a proper name. It does not have the article. And consequently, by this parallel, we can definitely tell that both infinitives are going to be the subjects, and the article uh, substantives them. So for me, the act of living is Christ. You could almost translate it like a gerund. And the act of dying is gain is the idea. It's, it's, it's remarkable how the article really turns that into a concrete notion. Moving on in Philippians, just a few verses later, uh, here's one that uh, can escape us because we don't see what the Greek is saying, but uh, this is, uh, again, one of these things that uh, for those of us who, who like to think about uh, grammar, uh, we uh, stay up late at night wrestling with these issues and we get excited about it uh, the next morning. Here's Philippians 1.29. It has been granted to you the on behalf of Christ thing is the idea, tahu per Christu. That which is on behalf of Christ is, is a literal translation and really an awkward one. And what is it that has been granted to us that's on behalf of Christ? Not only to believe in him, that is the act of believing in him, but also the act of suffering for him. So it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. So you have... This huperchristu, this prepositional phrase, that now is a substantival idea. You could almost hyphenate this as the on behalf of Christ. Of course, in English, we wouldn't grasp that. But this is why when you study the New Testament, you need to look at what the Greek is saying. And you can't just translate this. This is why we need expositors of the word who deal with these issues and uh, address what's going on in the text. So what Paul is saying here is, Here's what's been granted to you, something on behalf of Christ, and I would put a colon here. First, it's been granted to us to believe in him, but secondly, it's been granted to us to suffer for him, and these are both substantival ideas because of the use of the article. Then we have Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, which also has some really interesting things uh, with the article. Therefore, 
it says or he says we have legi without a subject mentioned. This is a, a typical thing that we get, or at least a, a, something we see, see on a frequent occasion in the New Testament, where when scripture is quoted, it's often introduced by legi without a subject. Because to the New Testament authors, it really didn't matter if it meant God says or scripture says, because scripture is God's voice. So Paul simply says, dia legi. And he goes on, and he says, when he ascended on high, he led captive captivity. He gave gifts to people. And he's quoting from the Psalms here. And then Paul gives an exposition. He says, now the statement, I'm adding the word statement because you have the word uh, the, ta, as modifying the anebe. And I've put that in italics above. The statement, he ascended. What does it mean that, except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? What this is saying is the statement he ascended, that is, I'm quoting from Psalm 69, and you can see this by his quotation, which has the participle form, on a boss, in it. But then when he quotes it, he's taking that one word, lifting it out of the uh, context, and he's uh, changing it so it can fit in with what he's saying now. He ascended means he also descended. But the article here is uh, what uh, older grammar is called a bracketing article, where it's the statement we could put in brackets, and here's uh, what it's used for to pick up uh, this phrase. We see that a few times in the New Testament, but it's really a, a fascinating thing to, to catch this. Next, we want to consider a truly bizarre use of the article in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. Now, Revelation has the most unusual syntax of any book of the New Testament. There have been whole uh, monographs published on the syntax of Revelation. In fact, there was one done uh, in uh, the early 1900s at uh, Princeton University uh, by T. Cowden Laughlin. It was on the solecisms of the apocalypse, I think, was the title of his doctoral dissertation. And it was 23 pages long, a doctoral dissertation. There have been large books uh, that have dealt with the syntax of Revelation because of how bizarre it is. I think one of the conclusions that scholars have come to in recent years is that the unusual syntax in Revelation is often, if not usually, linked to direct quotations from the Old Testament. And we actually have that in this very verse, Revelation 1-4, where we, uh, we have, after the preposition apa, we have ha'on. Uh, and I will discuss that when we get into preposition, so I'm going to leave that alone for now. But let's just focus on uh, the uh, ha aim. So John says at the beginning of Revelation, grace to you and peace from the one who is, apa ha'on, kai ha'en, kai ha or kamenos, and the one who is coming. Now, you can have an article modify a participle, ha'on, or ha or kamenos. That's a normal substantiving usage. But to have the article modify a finite verb when it's not a statement, it was, as we saw in Ephesians 4, 9, that's, that's simply bizarre. The he was, not only that, it's an imperfect which can't have a participle because it only occurs in the indicative. So what is John doing here? Well, he could have used an aorist, perhaps, of genomai, uh, but then that idea would be he became. And I think what he's trying to communicate is that I'm talking to you about the person who is, who was, and is coming, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he speaks about him as the he was, then he's really referring back, I think, to the Johannine prologue, if it's the same author. And uh, basically what we have there is you have I me used of deity and genomai used of creation. It's really an interesting distinction that you have going on. Uh, Raymond Brown in his commentary on John does a, a masterful job dealing with the Johannine prologue and the verbs uh, that are going on there. But here we have something where the author is doing unusual syntax for the sake of the theological point he is making. So I'd have to say the grammar is atrocious, the theology is, is really decent. So uh, that's what we have in uh, the use of the article. Sometimes uh, these writers go far beyond even how it's used elsewhere in uh, Koine Greek. Now we want to look at the article as a function marker, and it's used this way in, in nine different ways. Uh, the structural usage is really the key here. A function marker indicates the word that is being modified in its basic 
syntactical usage. It may or may not also have a semantic force. So it's telling us this is what the syntax is. Uh, but whether it has a semantic force, that's true some of the time. For example, uh, an article can modify a participle. When it does so and the participle uh, is not uh, modifying a, a, a noun somewhere, then we would call that a substantival participle. However, that participle also can be substantival without the article. So what is the article doing? It may be clarifying it or maybe strengthening it somehow. Uh, with the participle, though, that article now is not only turning it into a substantive, but then you look at that in terms of the case usage uh, and uh, those kinds of things and the typical articular usage to see how it's functioning as an individualizing article. But there are times where it doesn't have any semantic force. For example, with indeclinable names, uh, the articles, they're simply and purely to indicate what the case is, typically Semitic names. This is the difference uh, uh, between, for example, the Jacob of the Old Testament and the James of the New Testament. The Jacob of the Old Testament is Iacob. The James of the New Testament is Iacobos. It is a declinable name, and that's where you get these Hellenized names in New Testament Greek. If it's indeclinable, it's uh, really an Old Testament name and uh, strictly an Old Testament name or strictly a Semitically influenced name. There's nine different ways in which uh, the uh, article functions uh, as a function marker. And we're not going to discuss all of these. I'll give some examples. But it can denote, for example, adjectival positions. The second attributive position where you have the article, noun, and then another article, and then the adjective. Or the third attributive position where it's simply noun without the article, then article and adjective. It can also be used with possessive pronouns. And in fact, when a possessive pronoun uh, is used with a noun, it almost always takes the article. It doesn't typically modify a noun unless there is an article there. It can, and there's plenty of exceptions, but it, it routinely, normally, typically takes the article. Now, the article is also used in genitive constructions, and this follows what's known as Apollonius canon, and we'll discuss that when we get there because I do have some examples on that one. Uh, the article is used with indeclinable names to show what the case is, it's used with participles, as we said, to show that it's substantival or adjectival, and then you can see if it's got an individualizing force as well. It's also used with demonstratives, and there's some tricky issues for us to wrestle with with demonstratives that you need to be aware of. For example, if a demonstrative pronoun is functioning attributively to a noun, then that noun has to have the article. We have all of three exceptions in the entire New Testament where the noun does not have an article, and every one of them is considered irregular Greek, we should say. Uh, we also see the article with nominative nouns to show that it's the subject, uh, and it's uh, used to distinguish uh, the subject from predicate nominative as well as the object from the complement. And finally, the article is used with infinitives for a variety of functions. Now, I'm only going to give some illustrations. This, this could go on uh, for a long, long time to deal with the article as a function marker. But let's just look at some of these, and then you can read the grammar to see examples of all of them. Uh, for the first one, to denote adjectival positions, look at John 3.16. I'd like to go back to familiar verses so that you can see what's going on in the Greek text that helps you to see some things a little bit more clearly. And here we have, For God so loved the world that he gave his Son the unique one, which is an awkward translation, but it brings out the force of it. A.T. Robertson points out in his massive grammar of 1,500 pages that when you have a second attributive construction, like we have here, ton huion ton monogane, that what you have is equal emphasis on the noun and the adjective. In a first attributive position, the emphasis would go more on the noun. In a third attributive position, the emphasis now would be much stronger on just the ad adjective. So here you'd say the son, the unique one, but in English translation, we would say the one and only son or the unique son, something like that. Some like to translate it the only begotten son, uh, and others would say that's probably not an accurate translation uh, for monogamy here. But this illustrates a second attributive position. Now, when we think about genitive phrases, uh, we're going to look at Apollonius' canon, uh, and we'll look at Apollonius' corollary when we get into our discussion of the absence of the article. Apollonius' canon 
is simply this, that both the head noun and the genitive noun mimic each other with reference to articularity. Why is it called Apollonius Canon? It's named after the Greek grammarian Apollonius Discalus, who lived in the second century uh, AD or CE. Apollonius Discalus wrote this mass of grammar, and one of the things that uh, scholars have gleaned from it that has been extremely helpful is that when you have an, a, a noun and a genitive noun modifying it in regimen, when you have both of these together, what you basically have is either both nouns have the article or both nouns lack the article. That's Apollonius canon. They mimic each other with reference to articularity. Now there's another thing known as Apollonius Corollary, which uh, I developed when I was teaching at Grace Seminary back in the early 80s, and then one of my students, David Hedges, wrote his master's thesis on this and really developed it. And the Apollonius Corollary is simply that the semantics of the anarthrous constructions is typically going to be the same for both nouns, almost always the same for both nouns. If one of those nouns is definite, the other is definite. If one is qualitative, the other is qualitative. If one is indefinite, the other is indefinite. Although that's the rarest of all possibilities, the last category. So you have Apollonius canon, which has to do with the structure. Apollonius corollary, which has to do with semantics. Here's a, a great illustration uh, that touches on both of those, Matthew 3.16. And here we have, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. This is Jesus' baptism. And you notice that I've put the article before pneuma and before theu in brackets. And that's because a number of manuscripts don't have the article before either word. The manuscripts are uniform in either dropping both articles or in having both articles. That follows Apollonius canon. That's typically what you see. Now, if you drop the articles before both words, we do not have the translation he saw a spirit of a God descending like a dove. As I said, the indefinite plus indefinite construction is exceedingly uh, rare in terms of the semantics, Apollonius corollary. Typically, you're going to get definite, definite, or qualitative, qualitative, or the removed one where one would be definite and the other would be uh, qualitative. Uh, either noun could be in either direction. So if one of these nouns, and typically you're going to see it as the genitive noun, is we see as a definite concept. That's the tail that wags the dog, if you will. So here we have, we have to read this as, he saw the spirit of God, not a spirit of a God, nor a spirit of God. That also is really unusual to have a spirit of God. It's the spirit of God descending like a dove, whether you have the article with both nouns or not. So this raises a significant issue. When you see an anarthrous noun in Greek, do not assume that it must be indefinite. In English, we might assume that, but in Greek, anarthrous does not necessarily mean indefinite, and that's why we'll spend some time looking at the absence of the article and 10 ways in which a word can be definite without the article. The fourth usage of the article as a function marker is with indeclinable names to indicate the case. In John chapter 4, verse 5, we're dealing with the story of the woman uh, from Samaria who meets Jesus, the woman at the well, and uh, John gives us a, a narrative point to his readers in a side where he says, this well is near the field which Jacob gave to Joseph. And notice the Greek that Iacob is an indeclinable noun and Iosef is an indeclinable noun. Why do we have an article with Iosef but not with Iacope. Well, the reason is not that Iosef or Joseph is uh, to be considered a definite noun and Jacob is an indefinite. It would be nonsense to read this near the field which a Jacob gave to the Joseph. That's just not how we read this in English. But the reason for the article is strictly to show that Joseph is in the dative case and therefore it's going to be the indirect object. Jacob doesn't need an article. As soon as I've identified one of these nouns, we know that the other one is going to be the subject, and so there's no reason for uh, the author to put an article with both nouns. This is the economy of Greek usage, and it's really very elegant to see that. All right, number six in terms of function markers is with demonstratives. 
Here the article is used with the demonstratives in predicate position to indicate attributive function. So when you're dealing with a kainos and, and hutas, the article is going to be used with the noun. Uh, it's going to modify the noun. It'll have an attributive relationship to the noun, but that demonstrative pronoun will not be in attributive position. It'll be in predicate position, but it still modifies the noun. Well, how can you tell when it's going to be a predicate uh, pronoun then? Uh, that's going to be the context, but it's not going to be inside the article noun group. So if you see uh, a pronoun, a demonstrative pronoun with a noun, and there is no article there, then you can assume a predicate relationship. But if there is an article there, it could be attributive or it could be predicate. But you cannot assume a, an attributive relationship if that noun does not have the article. To be attributive, in other words, a demonstrative must be the outside the article noun group and the noun must have the article. Uh, we'll talk about that when we, we uh, we'll look at an, uh, another passage or two, I think. But Mark 15, 39 is a great illustration where you have the Roman centurion at uh, the cross of Christ saying, truly, this man was God's son. You've got hutos ha anthropos. The centurion is not saying, truly, this man was, or this was the man, the son of God. It's this man was the son of God. So hutos is in predicate position but attributive relationship to Anthropos. Now, John 2.11 is the other passage that I want to discuss because it's one where this, this basic rule is often forgotten by uh, exegetes and translators. In John 2.11, we do not have an article with the noun archein. We have tautain, epoiesin, archein. And in, uh, for example, the uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible, it has Jesus performed this first sign in Cana of Galilee. They are taking touting this as an attributive pronoun modifying sign. But if we are to do that legitimately with Greek, the archain must have the article tain with it. It does not. So that really is not a very accurate translation. And it makes some theological difference. The Net Bible here has Jesus did this as the first sign, as the first of his miraculous signs. In other words, it sees the relationship as a predicate relationship, an object complement construction. And another way to translate this with the poiao is Jesus made this to be the first of his miraculous signs. Either one of these is stressing not just Jesus' power, but his sovereignty in choosing what would be the very first miracle that he did. We saw earlier when we dealt with the accusative that that same construction occurs in John 4.54 when it's reaching back to this exact same passage. So John is not making some kind of a mistake here where we dropped off the article. He does it twice, and he's doing it to emphasize that Jesus not only exercised power when he changed the water into wine, but he exercised sovereign choice in choosing that to be the first of his miracles. This is an important point, and I use the HCSB as, as one translation. I don't mean to be picking on a particular translations. Most translations get it wrong in John 4.54. Here, some of them get it right, some of them uh, don't get it right. With infinitives, the article is also used as a function marker, and uh, there's uh, various uses of the infinitives, but I want to discuss just one construction, and that is the infinitive in an object complement construction. Denny Burke wrote his doctoral dissertation, it was published as a monograph by Sheffield, uh, on articular infinitives in the Greek of the New Testament, on the exegetical benefit of grammatical precision. It came out in 2006. And he discusses especially Philippians 2.6, then he wrote an article on this that was published, I believe, in the Tyndale Bulletin. Philippians 2.6 is the first verb, verse of the kenosis, that famous passage. It's the most commented on passage in all of Paul's letters, Philippians 2.6 through 11. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard the state of being equal with God, ta'ainai isa tha'o, as something to be grasped. Now, what Burke argues here 
is that the article with an infinitive that is the object of the infinitive is used strictly as a function marker. That means it has no semantic value. It does not also function to show that the infinitive is, say, anaphoric. Now, he, he gives quite a bit of evidence for this, but this is a very interesting point because he takes on especially N.T. Wright, who wrote a famous article on this, where he argued that the harpogmon, or the, uh, the, the ta'ina isis tha'o, the equality with God, or the being equal with God, is anaphoric. That article ta is anaphoric, going back to more faith the ooh. What Wright was essentially arguing, it gets a little bit complicated, but this is such an important passage that it's, it's uh, valid and significant and important for us to wrestle with this, that you've got this, the equality with God, if you have an anaphoric article, it's going back to the more faith the ooh. What that's telling us is that equality with God is saying the same thing as the form of God. And so Wright is arguing that since the article is anaphoric, therefore that tells him how to interpret harpagmon. Harpagmos is a very difficult word. It's very rare. To, uh, how do we uh, read it? There's a, a lengthy entry in Bdeg on this. Is it something to be retained? Or is it something to be grasped for is basically the, the two ideas. I'm, I'm summarizing uh, Ralph Martin's doctoral dissertation and a lot of literature that, have been, that, that has dealt with this and, and making it a little bit too simplistic. Does it mean, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard this equality with God as something to be hung on to, to be cl clung to, to be retained? Or is the article not anaphoric? And therefore, it's not referring back to the Morphe Theu, and consequently, they are not making the same statement, and therefore, Harpagmon means something different than something to be retained. There's a lot of issues that are bound up with how you take this article with the infinitive, and Denny Burke has done a really very interesting and significant and compelling piece of work where he essentially argues that the Morphe Theu is a strong affirmation of the deity of Christ. And that's because morphe is a word that typically, not always, but typically is referring to a form that corresponds to the essence. So who, although he existed in the essence of God, who, although he was in essence God, is what it would be saying. But then Burke says the equality with God is talking not about his essence, but about his functional role. And that would mean that here's a passage that may speak of the eternal functional subordination of the Son in the economic trinity, although ontologically the Father and the Son are equal. Now, I realize I've dealt with a lot of theology here in, in one broad stroke, but what I'm saying is there's a number of issues that are at stake here. How we take this article, whether it's just a function marker, and Burke essentially argues it never is used as more than a function marker with an infinitive in these object complement constructions. Or if it is uh, more than that and it's anaphoric, and how this impacts the meaning of harpogmon and what it means in terms of the Trinity, uh, whether there's eternal subordination of the Son, a number of issues are here. We're not going to try to solve this, but I simply want you to be aware of this, that some of these really fine points are simply missed when we don't pay attention to what's going on in the Greek. All right, that's the end of the article's uses. Now there's kind of an appendix in this chapter on the absence of the article. Uh, this is where it belongs because we're dealing with the article, we're just now dealing with the absence of the article. I want to begin by looking at the possible forces of uh, a noun, and that's really what we're, we're looking at essentially, but we're looking at a number of other constructions as well. Can a noun or a substantive, uh, when it does not have the article, can it be definite? Yes, it can. But there's two other ideas that it can have. It can also be indefinite or it can be qualitative. And you'll notice in these Venn diagrams that there is some overlap. Sometimes it's uh, difficult to distinguish an indefinite noun from a qualitative noun, which puts more of an emphasis on the quality or essence or nature of something. And an indefinite means that this is just one of a class without specifying which one of a class. 
A definite noun is saying I'm picking out which one of the class belongs there, but qualitative and definite sometimes overlap, especially with abstract nouns. So there is some overlap, but notice that indefinite and definite are very clear demarcators. They're not going to be speaking about the same thing. Now, there's 10 ways for a noun to be definite without the article in Greek, and we'll, we'll list these, we'll talk about them quickly, and then we'll give uh, some more examples that uh, illustrate this. We start with the first three. Uh, if it's a proper name, it obviously will be definite because proper names uh, that specify a particular individual. If it's the object of a preposition, it typically doesn't take the article as uh, the object of preposition, and it typically is definite. More work needs to be done on this is to determine why it would be definite when it's the object of the preposition, and yet that's typically the case, but it's not always the case. And consequently, uh, you need to look at that case by case, pardon the pun, and look at the context and see some other things that would tell you whether this is definite or indefinite or even qualitative. With ordinal numbers, it's going to be definite. We're talking about the first book of Moses, the second book of Moses, the second miracle that Jesus did. It's not a second, but the second. It's specifying an exact uh, entity. As a predicate nominative, the noun also can be definite if that predicate nominative is preceding the verb. Now, that doesn't mean it will be. We'll discuss that in article part two, where we talk about Caldwell's rule and, more importantly, the broader issue of Caldwell's construction. What happens when an anarthrous predicate nominative is thrown in front of the verb? Well, the basic idea here is the further forward it is in the sentence, typically that means you're putting greater emphasis on that word, and so the word order tells us that it's moving out of the realm of indefinite and into the realm of qualitative or even, at times, definite. A predicate nominative that precedes the verb can be definite without the article. Fifth is uh, a complement in an object complement construction, and this is where it precedes the object. It's almost exactly like uh, the predicate nominative that comes before the verb in a subject predicate nominative construction. The difference is that the verb in object complement constructions is going to be an infinitive, ini, uh, or uh, something along those lines, but um, it's not going to be uh, uh, always present. So it'll often be implied sometimes they'll have host, sometimes uh, ini, sometimes gnesthai. But uh, that complement, if it moves in front of the object, it tends towards the realm of qualitative or definite. Then we've got uh, the sixth, which is monadic nouns, one-of-a-kind nouns, the sun, the moon, the devil. There is only one devil, and we'll get to that in a very important passage here in just a few minutes. But monadic nouns, by their very nature, are definite. Now, what happens when you use the article? Well, the article is not being used to definitize something that's already definite. It has other functions to distinguish it from this one or something along those lines, sometimes a different kind of emphasis. And that's why we talked about how the basic idea of the article is not to definitize. The fundamental reason for that is that there's 10 ways in which a noun can be definite without the article. So that means the article is being used with these constructions in uh, ways other than to definitize typically. Also abstract nouns, faith, love, hope, truth, those kinds of words uh, often lack the article and yet are definite. These are the words that move in the realm of that space between qualitative and definite. We're not exactly sure if we should call it one or the other. And with or without the article, there doesn't seem to be too much of a difference. It seems to be just uh, a matter of uh, not much choice involved, but just a style of writing, as A.T. Robertson suggests, where he says, no vital difference was felt between anarthrous and articular abstract nouns. I think that's, that's accurate. Then the next category, genitive constructions, Apollonius corollary. Uh, we'll look at uh, something that deals with that a little bit further. I think we'll look at Matthew 3.16 again. And we've talked about that. Apollonius corollary has to do with uh, a head noun and a genitive noun, both are anarthrous, both tend to have the same semantic value of definite plus definite, qualitative or, and qualitative, but hardly ever is it indefinite and definite or indefinite and indefinite. Those two just don't seem to occur very much. 
Then finally, the last two categories with pronominal adjective, pos and holos. The noun can be definite without an article. So uh, every temple, every house, every person with pos, it's, it's moving in the realm of definite almost in the sense of a generic. Uh, and you might even say all Jerusalem where you don't have uh, the article. Uh, and then generic nouns. Uh, these are going to also uh, function as definite categories without the article. And again, with the article, like abstract nouns, it, there's very little difference between an articular generic noun and an anarthrous uh, generic noun. Let me give some illustrations on just some of these. We start with John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word beginning is a monadic noun. It is also the object of the preposition. The author here is harking back all the way to Genesis 1, causing the reader to think about Genesis chapter 1, where God creates everything by his word. And the very first word, verse says, in the beginning was the word. It's a, it's a fascinating way in which he's constructing his argument that really uh, makes sense finally when you get to chapter 5, uh, where there's some, some difference, uh, differences and shifts that we see in John's gospel. But the point here is that beginning is not to be translated in a beginning because we're dealing with a monadic idea that is both monadic, one of a kind, and the object of the preposition. So art the article is not needed. Luke 21, 25, we also have monadic nouns. There will be signs in the sun and moon. They don't need the article. There's only one sun and one moon in the universe of discourse of the ancient world. Of course, we know there's more than one sun and one moon today, but that's not uh, how they were thinking about these things. And even today, when we speak about the sun, we don't mean one of several stars. We're talking about the, the sun of our solar system. Luke 19.9, today, salvation has come to your house. Here you have an abstract noun that is functioning uh, virtually definitely because it's the subject of the sentence and it's not an indefinite a salvation, which would not make any sense with an abstract noun, but it's moving in the area of definite uh, qualitative. Matthew 3.16, we've already discussed this with reference to Apollonius Canon, and here with the corollary, if you drop the article, both pneuma and thu would be considered definite because thu definitely would be considered definite, and that really is, as I said, the tail that uh, wags the dog in this instance. A spirit of God is, is right out on that. It's not going to be a likely option. And here's a passage, John 670, that I would have to say has been almost universally mistranslated. We have, did I not choose you, the 12? Yet one of you is the devil, is the translation that I'm offering here. Almost every English translation has, one of you is a devil. Why do they do that? The reason they do that is because both diabolos and daimonion in the King James Version are translated devil. The word demon doesn't even occur in the King James Bible, at least not in the New Testament. And consequently, uh, when you have devils in the plural as the King James has, to the English reader who has been just uh, imbued with King James thinking, there are many devils. Even C.S. Lewis speaks of devils in the plural in, in some of his books, like screw tape letters. And uh, what you've got then is this English sense of there is more than one devil, but there's also the devil. But really, that is not the case. There is one diabolos, even though this actually is an adjective, it's functioning substantively, and it does not need the article to be definite. Now, an argument has come against this to the effect of, what, is Jesus really saying Judas is the devil? Well, no more so literally than he is calling Peter Satan after Peter confesses him as the Christ. We ought not to read this literally, of course, and yet the way we must read it is, did I not choose you, the twelve, yet one of you is the devil? That is, he's imbued with the spirit of the devil. And uh, the way Jesus spoke often, of course, is, is uh, hyperbolically and metaphorically and in, in a sense that is much deeper than what it looks like on the surface. But I would have to say both because it's a monadic, technically a monadic adjective, and because it's a predicate nominative that comes before the verb, it's a double reason to view this as the devil 
And, and I will say categorically, translations that have it as a devil, I think, misunderstand this, and they are indebted to the King James Bible and the misunderstanding of, of uh, the idea that there may be many devils when there really is only one. The last illustration I want to give is Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, which is the first place we read of angelos kuriu in the New Testament. We have a number of these instances in the New Testament, and we have a number of them in the Old Testament as well. Here we have either an angel of the Lord or the angel of the Lord appeared to, to him in a dream to Joseph saying, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And uh, it's almost universally translated as an angel of the Lord. Well, if you think about Apollonius corollary, we've got a head noun that would be then indefinite and the genitive noun that would be definite. Is that likely? Normally, we would say, no, it's not likely at all. It really occurs very, very few times. However, kurios, as a Greek translation of Yahweh, typically does not need the article, especially when it's a translation of Yahweh, which in all of these places, it clearly is in the New Testament. So it may be that the Greek writers of the New Testament are simply emulating the Septuagint. But it's interesting to think about this a little bit further, because in the Hebrew Bible, we have Malach Yahweh, uh, angel of the Lord, and yet in the English translation of the Hebrew Bible, this occurs uh, uh, over a hundred times, Malach Yahweh, and there are times where it is followed with Ha Malach, the angel, where it's anaphoric, going back to that previous angel. But Malach Yahweh, in most English translations for the Old Testament, is almost always, if not always, translated as the angel of the Lord. The Septuagint picks that up and emulates exactly what the Hebrew does. It has angelos kariu, the only time you have the article is if it's anaphoric. We have the anaphoric article here in Matthew chapter 1 as well, when it says the angel a few verses later, going back to this angel. So does that mean that it's an angel of the Lord in the New Testament, but the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? There is absolutely no linguistic distinction between angel of the Lord in the Masoretic text, the Septuagint, or the New Testament. I would have to say that between the Old Testament and the New Testament, it is vital for us to treat uh, angel of the Lord as the same thing. It's either the angel of the Lord every time or an angel of the Lord every time. Now, what if we take it as the angel of the Lord every time? Here we have the angel of the Lord that many scholars would say in the Old Testament is the pre-incarnate Christ. Well, this would be barely the pre-incarnate Christ because Mary is already pregnant with Jesus. Is that something that we have? That's a fascinating theological discussion for us to wrestle with. Is it possible for the angel to speak to Joseph and yet the Lord is himself in Mary's womb? You have this same angel that appears at the, the tomb, at the resurrection. He appears, um, uh, to uh, I think, to Peter to get him out of uh, jail. Uh, all sorts of places punctuated through, throughout the New Testament, the angel of the Lord appears. Is it the angel of the Lord or is it an angel of the Lord? If it's an angel of the Lord, then we may need to revisit whether we have Moloch Yahweh in the Old Testament as a Christophany. There's a number of issues that are involved here, but one of the things that is imperative for us to recognize is that there is no linguistic distinction between angel of the Lord in the Masoretic text, the Septuagint, and the New Testament. And that opens up a very significant can of worms. Well, that ends the article part one, lesson two, a lot of material in the article, a lot of things to think about and we've just barely scratched the surface and perhaps a little bit more.